Hello, friends. Welcome to this uh, series on informed consent and research studies. In the first section of this uh, series, we talked about the principles of medical ethics and the components of an informed consent. In this second session now, we are going to discuss the elements of review for an institutional ethics committee and what we can do when informed consent is not possible or if this is not needed. So what are the key points that uh, a member of the ethics committee should look at when he's reviewing a research proposal? That is the focus of this session. So there are 11 components as uh, advised by the in Indian Council of Medical Research. You should be looking at social values. You should be assessing the risks and benefits involved in this study. Should be looking at the payment if there is any for participation. Have uh, make a note of community considerations. Does it affect the community? Does it go against community sensibilities? Is there a disclosure of conflict of interest by the participants, by the uh, researchers themselves? What is the scientific design and conduct of the study? What is the selection and uh, recruitment criteria? What is the inclusion and exclusion criteria? What is the sampling methodology that the researchers are going to practice? Is there adequate protection of privacy and the confidentiality? Then reviewing the informed consent process as has been documented in the proposal. What is the qualification of research and are the study sites adequate enough to uh, conduct this kind of a study? And what are the plans for medical compensation and management of individuals if they happen to get any study related injury? But for the purpose of this particular session, we are going to focus on the point nine, which is the review of the informed consent process. So the elements of review include, in case it's a, a clinical trial, then it should include the trial treatment schedule and the probability of random assignment. There should be details about blinding. There should be details about compensation and or treatment available in cases of injury. There should be a statement which includes the contact person if there is any problem that the participant faces, has some queries, wants to know about his rights and in case there is an injury. Is there an anticipated pay payment? And what are the participants' responsibilities in terms of participation? The informed consent document should include a statement which is stating that the participation is voluntary and that the consent can be withdrawn at any time by the participant and that the refusal will not involve any kind of penalty, discrimination, or discomfort to the participant. The informed consent form should include statements in event of injury that there will be free medical management as long as it's required. In case of a trial-related injury or death, a financial compensation should be there. The informed consent form should include mandatorily the address, the qualification, occupation, and the income of the subject. This becomes important when there are trial-related injuries or deaths and compensation has to be calculated. So based upon this information, the courts and the ethics committee will have to make a presentation of what is the amount of compensation that should be paid to the subject who has had an adverse event. It should include the name and address of the participant's nominee who needs to be contacted in case there is a death. And it's mandatory to hand over a copy of the signed informed consent form to the participant themselves. There are certain other elements of review, which the, uh, the ethics committee member should also be uh, sensitive to. Uh, they should note whether the participants or the researchers are planning to record the procedure of consent? Are they going to preserve these recordings? 
these are more important for sponsored randomized controlled trials and they have now gained more importance in in times of covid when consent is being taken from a distance and there is sometimes no practical or no physical meeting between the researcher and the participant at this time a video recording or an audio recording of a virtual consent which is taken at a distance is mandatory in addition to the conditions that we have just noted or in in addition to the elements of review that we have just uh, talked about the things that we discussed in the previous section regarding uh, the information that should be there in informed consent form or the informed consent document as a component of the informed consent process these also need to be reviewed and the individual members of the ethics committee who are analyzing and who are reviewing the research protocol should check for this all these components and see whether they are not there or not statement that this is a research indicating what is its purpose what is the duration what are the procedures what benefits it holds are there any foreseeable risks is there uh, a breach of confidentiality not possible what are the precautions being taken what is the reimbursement being given to a participant and what is the treatment or compensation process and if the research team has identified themselves let's go on to uh, situations where informed consent is not possible or sometimes when it's not needed so sometimes it is uh, possible that the patient may be incapable of consent he may be comatose he may be drowsy he may be sleepy he may be too sick in these cases it is important to take consent from a legally authorized or acceptable representative of this individual please also note that incapacity to make a particular decision is definitely not equal to an inability to make any decision although a person may be unable to give an informed consent or consent to an entire procedure but that does not mean that he cannot take any decision and that he will never be able to take a decision in future so one should not uh, assume that the patient is incapable of taking any decision and that he will continue to remain incapable in all future times so that means the person the researcher needs to check back and if the person attains uh, the capacity to agree or consent at a later stage in his uh, in the course of this research then informed consent should be taken directly from the individual at that time now, there are some situations when informed consent may not be needed when an individual comes in for an investigation or a treatment then the consent is implied and a specific treatment consent is not taken when we are in clinical practice in addition when we are conducting research a separate consent is not needed when the research involves images of internal organs or structures which cannot be identified to an individual obviously if there are images of pathology slides which have got no identification characteristics if these are laparoscopic or endoscopic images again which do not carry any identifying information if they are recordings of an organ function or if they are radiographical images but again the most important thing in this is they are all anonymized and they cannot be traced back to the individual from where they came but in all these cases the researchers need to still apply to the institutional ethics committee for a waiver of consent and only if the institutional ethics committee agrees that consent is not needed then the researchers can proceed with their study with a waiver of consent there are certain other conditions which are important for granting waiver of consent a waiver of consent can be granted if research is not possible without a waiver and that waiver is scientifically justified if there are some retrospective studies where participants are not identified or they cannot be contacted now there is some data which exists in the hospital and the participants cannot be contacted 
if there is research on anonymized data or on biological samples. Sometimes there are some public health studies or there are surveillance programs or program evaluation studies. In such cases, if so deemed, then a waiver of consent may be granted. And sometimes there is a lot of data which is available in public domain. So in case the data is available in public domain, no specific consent may be required from individual participants. Sometimes, like we had recently in the pandemic, when there is an emergency or disaster and consent cannot be taken at the time of recruitment, then every attempt should be made to obtain the consent of the participating individual whose data is being recorded at the earliest at a later stage. So in this session, we talked about what are the elements of a good review process. And we spoke about situations when informed consent is either not needed or is not possible. With this, we come to an end of this second session in this series. In the third session, we are going to talk about situations or special situations that can arise with the informed consent process. Thank you for joining in and hope you all have a good day.